Good afternoon, almost evening. Good afternoon. Welcome to the law school at Case Western Reserve University. My name is Aisha Bell Hardaway, and on behalf of the Social Justice Law Center, we are grateful for the opportunity to co-host tonight's event. The Social Justice Law Center serves to ensure that students at our law school interested in the contours of American inequality have access to top-notch legal educational offerings and experiences. For far too long, law schools around the country have failed to recognize the inadequacy of a legal education that ignores the way in which um, inequality is baked into the brick and mortar foundation of America's legal structures. The Social Justice Law Center aims to ensure that case law students who are motivated to wrestle with understanding and developing solutions to doctrinal, I'm sorry, solutions to design to rectify inequality and oppression have access to doctrinal curricular offerings, research and writing opportunities, hands-on experiential educational offerings, and meaningful ways to engage with the intellectually honest and thought-provoking leading scholar uh, scholarship, such as what we'll have tonight with Professor Kristen Henning, our brilliant guest lecturer. I have to say, uh, it's not lost on me that our topic of tonight, America's criminalization of black youth, is going to take place at a time when our nation is also watching a trial play out. Um, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial uh, and, and all of the realities that we're seeing there, if you've been following it, really demonstrate the ways in which we go out of our ways sometimes to acknowledge the adolescence, the youth, the, the youthfulness, the immaturity, the poor decision making of some youth in our country. And I have to ima imagine, maybe I'm not even imagining, I know in my knower that if Mr. Rittenhouse was black, that this trial would have played out far differently um, so far, uh, thus far. So um, I think it's, I just wanted to share that. It's important uh, for you to know also that we couldn't have done this event that it had this wonderful day with Professor Henning uh, without the tireless work of Gabriella Celeste, uh, her invaluable collaboration, and the efforts of our co-sponsors, uh, the, um, the Schubert Center for Child Studies and the Milton and Charlotte Kramer Law Clinic here at the law school. And now I'll turn it over to Gabriella, the policy director of the Schubert Center, to introduce our guest of honor. Thank you so much, Professor Hardaway, and everyone for joining us today. I can tell you when Aisha and I um, first heard about the release of your book, we were so excited, and we knew right away we had to get you here to Cleveland. So we are thrilled um, that we're, we have a chance and I get a chance to be here on behalf of the Schubert Center for Child Studies to introduce Professor Kristen Henning, or Chris, as those of us who know her affectionately call her, yes, a brilliant lawyer, but also a nationally recognized writer, educator, and thought leader for transformative reform in our justice system. I'd like to take a few minutes to share a bit more about Chris, to recognize her uniquely important contributions in the field of juvenile justice and indeed social justice, and how lucky we are to have her, to talk about her work and her recent book, The Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black Youth, which by the way, are gonna be outside. Please buy them, get them. It's an incredible book. I've, I've, I've read it um, the last few days, making sure I read the whole thing. It was, couldn't put it down. Chris currently serves as the director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic, an initiative at Georgetown Law, where she supervises law students and represents accused youth in the DC Superior Court. She is also, uh, was also associate dean of clinics and experiential learning from 2017 to 2020, and advisory to the dean on community justice. She, since receiving her BA from Duke University and her JD from Yale Law School, as well as an LLM from Georgetown Law, Chris has been representing children for over 25 years. Actually, she did an early stint as a legal intern in a North Carolina prosecutor's office, which helped her inform her career in defending children. After teaching 
a teaching fellowship in the Georgetown Criminal and Juvenile Justice Clinics, Chris joined the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, where she helped to create and then lead the first juvenile unit specifically dedicated to meeting the unique needs of children in our juvenile legal system. In fact, that's how I first got to know Chris when we brought her down to Louisiana 20 years ago, we were talking about today, to help us conduct a statewide assessment of the quality of defense counsel as part of the early days of what was then the American Bar Association's Juvenile Justice Center, now the National Juvenile Defender Center, um, where Chris continues to train juvenile defenders from around the country. And over the years, you know, she and I were doing these assessments in states like Florida and Mississippi and Georgia and even Ohio. In fact, in 2003, after Ohio Justice Cut Short assessment came out that Chris was a large part of, our state established a juvenile department within our Ohio Public Defender's Office. And this division is now seen as a national model for zealous representation and advocacy for youth in Ohio's justice system. But Chris's impact, of course, um, has extended much further since then, serving as the director of the Mid-Atlantic Juvenile Defender Center, as a member of board of directors for the Center for Children's Law and Policy, and as a national consultant to numerous state and federal agencies, including the US uh, Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. She worked with the MacArthur Foundation's Juvenile Indigent um, Defense Action Network, developing a national training curriculum. And in partnership with NJDC, she helped create a racial justice for youth toolkit for defenders, and recently launched something called the Ambassadors for Racial Justice Program, a year-long program for defenders committed to challenging racial inequities and the juvenile legal system by thinking outside the box and pushing for reform. So Chris has written extensively and incisively about race, adolescence, and the justice system. In addition to her book, you can find her work in numerous law review journals. She was appointed as advisor to the American Law Institute's Reinstatement on Children and Law Project, and has also been honored with too many awards, I'm sorry for me to name, um, in, in excellence in juvenile defense. So Chris has become a highly sought after speaker on how the legal system criminalizes normal adolescent behaviors and consequences of racism and trauma that black children experience as a result. Drawing on her two and a half decades of work in juvenile court and weaving together the stories of her youth clients and their families and the countless stories of other black children like our own Tamir Rice, coupled with meticulous research, I'm talking over 100 pages of footnotes, by the way. Um, her book examines the physical, psychological, and societal harms of discriminatory and aggressive police surveillance during adolescence, and it illuminates the devastating long-term consequences criminalizing childhood has on the development of black youth and the extended damage to parents, uh, siblings, and loved ones, and, and really our whole communities. Her book serves as a wake-up call for the entire legal system in particular, police, prosecutors, judges, probation, and the defense bar. I heard Chris say recently that her hope is that this book creates a kind of collective aha moment for our culture and key decision makers in our legal system to change the narrative and see and treat black children as our children. None of us are immune from bias and her work puts us all on notice to hold ourselves and our justice system accountable to do yet better by our young people. I wanna end with, on a more personal note. Chris grew up on a small southern town in a small southern town, comes to this work from a value system rooted deeply in her own faith, her family's long-standing activism, and her own personal experience with loss and trauma. Her abiding commitment to justice on the behalf of children and young people is manifest. I call it grace in action. And I was privileged to witness her grace in action earlier today in a dialogue with kids at the Boys and Girls Club, the way she affirms their intellect and their curiosity their sense of personal power. We are truly honored to have Chris in our beloved city and campus. Please join me in welcoming Professor and Attorney Chris Hunt. All right. Well, I have to say it's my honor to be here um, with you all. I just so appreciate the invitation to come to Cleveland and to Case Western uh, Reserve University in particular. Um, and I just, I want to say thank you to Gabriella Celeste. We have indeed known each other for many, many years, um, being on the ground, in the work. Uh, I'm so privileged and honored to 
you know, I've known about Aisha Hardaway, Professor Hardaway to the rest of you <laughs> um, uh, for years and to finally get to meet you and connect around this project. Thank you to the Schubert Center for co-sponsoring e this event. Um, but more important, I just thank all of you for creating the space for a conversation like this, right? These are the hard conversations, but they are the conversations that have to be had. Um, so I appreciate every single one of you who is here um, and ready to engage uh, around this topic. So I want to dive right in, and I want to say uh, off the bat, as um, you know, Celeste, uh, as Gabriella said, I am the director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and Initiative at Georgetown Law. Um, and before that, I was an attorney with the DC Public Defender Service focused specifically on representing children in the District of Columbia. So in total, I have now been representing children for almost 26 years. And here's the most disturbing fact, that in that 26 years, I have only represented four white children. Four white children in the nation's capital. And so some of you might be thinking, well, maybe there are no white kids in Washington, DC. <laughs> that would not be true. Others might be thinking when they hear that stat, well, maybe you know, white kids aren't committing crime. Guess what? Also not true, right? Statistically not true, plus everything that we know about adolescent development and how the brain works, and I'll say more about it. So it is really, it became, ah, got to move my slides, don't worry. Um, so it became really difficult for me to continue to do this work for as long as I have without really beginning to ask the hard questions. So questions like whether or not this is happening, these racial disparities that I see in Washington, D.C., I wanted to know, is it happening all over the country? I wanted to know why. I wanted the why answer, right? Why do these disparities exist? I also wanted to know whether these disparities, what kind of impact were these disparities having on black children in particular? mentally, physically, psychologically, developmentally. Um, I also wanted to know whether the disparate uh, uh, targeting or the disparate policing and criminalization of black youth was making America any safer. And then if it isn't, if the disparities aren't helpful and they're not justified, then what do we do about it? And so that's what this book is about. It's about all of those questions. And so, of course, in response to that first question, is it happening in other parts of the country, we know that the answer is yes. The racial disparities are evident all over the country. And Ohio is a microcosm of that reality. Right here in Cuyahoga County, although black children make up only 40% of the youth, youth's population, they accounted for 67, more than 67% of all youth who were involved in a delinquency case or an unruly case in 2020, just last year. Black youth in the county are also significantly more likely to be held in detention. And again, although black youth in the county only account for 40% of all youth, they accounted for 82%, 82.8% to be exact, of all youth who were held in juvenile detention last year. Statewide, in Ohio, black youth make up only 18.7% of the population, which I actually didn't know. I was pretty surprised by that data. But guess what? They account for 61.5% of all youth at the deep end of the system, meaning uh, youth committed to the Department of Youth Services. And then one last uh, but really important uh, data point is that black youth are significantly more likely to be transferred to adult court, bound over to adult court. And this is true, I think this is really uh, one piece of nuance, I'm gonna, then I'm gonna come out of the statistics, but one piece of nuance is that these racial disparities exist despite 
relentless and successful efforts by advocates in the state to reduce the total number of young people who were being transferred or bound over to the adult system. So to really play this out, in 2010, there were about 303 youth who were transferred to adult court. By 2014, as a result of the advocacy um, by folks in the city, the total number of youth transferred to adult court was cut almost in half. That's a good, that's a moment to pause and to celebrate. But the racial disparities increased considerably from 2006 to 2014, and they persist today. Just to make the point clear, racial, the black youth accounted for 65% of all youth transferred in 2016, but they accounted for 75% of all youth transferred to adult court in 2010, and then 83% of black youth transferred to adult court in 2014. Powerful. And then as you see, the last uh, the, the, day, the last block there is 2019, and in 2019's racial disparities persist with black youth accounting for about 81% of youth transferred to adult court. And I wanted to just know what was happening this year in 2020, and this is what's important about the, the, the nuance. So fortunately, um, in 2020, we're seeing the racial disparity drop just a little bit with um, black youth accounting for 71.9% of transfers to adult court. So at first when I read the stat, I was like, oh, this is a good point. Guess what? That's 71.9% of, of youth transferred to adult court are African American. When they account for, what did I tell you on the previous slides? Only 18% of the state's population. We can't celebrate that, right? We can't celebrate that. There's so much more work to do. So, Whenever I talk about the incarceration of, of black youth, people automatically assume that I am talking about serious violent offenses. But this is far from the truth. Very few youth of any race commit the kinds of offenses that we are most afraid of in society. Murder, rape, aggravated assault, and instead, the vast majority, the vast majority of young people all across the country are in juvenile courts in particular for nonviolent, low-level, or nonviolent, low-level felonies or misdemeanors. And when you unpack the facts involved in those cases, the vast majority of it is also normal adolescent behaviors. What do I mean by that? I mean behaviors, things that you and I all engaged in when we were kids. Okay. And so it's really important to understand, and I really want to drive this point home, that adolescents act like adolescents all over the world. Not just in the United States, but all over the world. There have been international studies about the, the fundamental features of adolescent development. And if I were doing, if I weren't doing a lecture and I was teaching a class, I'd ask you, <laughs> right, to, for a little bit of call and response. And you would tell me, right, we know that adolescents are impulsive, reactive, emotional, sensation seekers, risk takers. Peer influence is not a myth. <laughs> kids do what their friends do. And kids do what they think their friends are doing, <laughs> even when their friends aren't doing it, right? They often make really bad decisions. They're really not great at strategic thinking. And they care more <laughs> about the immediate rewards than the long-term consequences. That's for children all over the world. But even when we get it annoyed at the recklessness of adolescence, we still treat white teenagers with tolerance, grace, compassion, forgiveness, if not downright humor and entertainment, right? And so um, I always like to use this old uh, classic movie, and I'm looking around the room, and I, I believe that a lot of y'all in the room are going to recognize it, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> I have to be careful with my students, because my students are like, never heard of it. <laughs> so you might have to replace that with super bad or some other equivalent. But for my purpose, it's such a classic contrast, right? Y'all remember Ferris Bueller steals a car, right? Oh, an expensive car from his friend's father and 
drives throughout the entire day without consequence, right? And then we have The Wire, the TV show from the, the mini documentary um, uh, set in Baltimore where the young black child or the black, black children steal cars and it's immediately problematized, right? It's exactly what you talk about with Kyle Rittenhouse, right? The different ways, even when there's crime, even when there's crime, it's the different responses, right? So Donut here can barely get a block without everybody looking up and saying, what's wrong with this picture, right? Yeah, drive around all day long, right? Really important point. And so we really demonstrate none of that grace and tolerance and humor for black children. But I want to put like real theft aside for a moment and draw us back into these normal adolescent behaviors and think about what we cared about as teenagers. Today, black children are criminalized for virtually every aspect of adolescence, from the clothes they wear, the music they listen to, the way they wear their hair, talking back to adults, playing on a cell phone, having a party, coming home after curfew, experimenting with drugs, and playing with toys in a park. And so I really, throughout this book, I try to weave together stories, right? Stories of children, black children, who have been arrested or criminalized in some way or another for just being kids. And I weave that together with data and research in a way that I really hope uh, that will help educate the community about the state of black adolescence. Um, and so just for a little bit of fun, consider these images. So. These black boys are wearing sagging pants, right? You might not like it. I don't love seeing sagging underwear, right? But there are uh, cities across the country that will uh, criminally prosecute a child for wearing sagging pants. Contrast this to who is the most famous sagger <laughs> in the United States, Justin Bieber who just in January of 2020 issued a statement that my pants will stay sagging. He's an icon, right? Would never think about arresting him for that. We've got these children playing on their cell phone when they're supposed to be in class, and we've got Shakira Murphy in South Carolina being ripped out of her seat. We've got white children listening to heavy metal, rock, country music with the same violent, misogynistic, and profane language as every other genre of music. Every other genre of music, pop, every one of it, right? Um, and without any consequences. And then we play rap, and it's considered the most dangerous music in the world. White kids play with toy guns, and it's adorable. Black kids play with toy guns, and they get killed. We all know that right here in Cleveland. So while white youth, and this is really the, the key, the heart of, of what it means, the privilege of adolescence, right? While white youth are allowed to joy, enjoy the privileges of adolescence, which includes physical safety, public affirmation, adventure, experimentation, extended periods of social and academic freedom, black youth are suspended, expelled, stopped, frisked, arrested, and prosecuted as if they were adults. And we cannot talk about the criminalization of black youth without focusing at least for a moment on police officers in particular. And so few of us, really, so few of us truly understand just how pervasive policing is in certain black and brown communities. Um, and so I think the best way to help you and to help all of us understand um, how black youth experience policing is to listen to the stories of black youth and in black youth that I have represented. So let me tell you about a client named Andre. So Andre was a 15-year-old boy that I represented. He was walking down the street in Washington, D.C. with a friend that I call James. There was no report of crime. Uh, the boys weren't doing anything out of the ordinary. They weren't laughing. They weren't using drugs. Um, and the police drove up next to them, rolled down the window, and said, did you hear any gunshots? And both of the boys said no, and they kept walking. The police officers weren't satisfied, continued to pursue them, and said to the boys, can you show me your waist? 
At which point, and I love the, the facial expression, people are shocked. This happens all the time, all over the country. So if an officer says to the boys, can you show me your waist? The boys lift their shirts so that the officers could see their waistband to see that they weren't carrying any weapons. The police officer still weren't satisfied, yells out to them, can I search you? At which point the boys say yes. <clears throat> officers pull over, four officers, uniform, pull over, jump out of the car, push the boys up against the wall and begin to frisk them and then do a full body search. So I'm a criminal defense attorney. I'm baffled, right? Really? You let the officers search you. Um, and I'm always baffled by it, it happens over and over again. And so when I asked Andre, so why in the world would you let them search you? He said to me, wouldn't you? They were gonna frisk us anyway, and if we tried to run, they were gonna shoot us in the back. Such a profound moment, such a profound moment, right? And I've been doing the work for years and still just am moved by the stories that our clients tell. And so now there are truly generations of black youth who have grown up under the constant surveillance of police. In many black neighborhoods, police are parked on the corner. They drive through the community at all hours of the night. They're asking young people, where are you going? Where are you coming from? Where's your parent? Um, and young black children feel like they are under constant surveillance every day of their lives. And then there is a growing body of research documenting the extraordinary psychological trauma <coughs> that policing imposes on black children during the most important uh, stages or ages in their development. Studies show that black children who have been the target of excessive stops and frisk or who live in heavily policed neighborhoods report high rates of fear, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, they're hypervigilant, meaning that they're always on guard, not trusting police officers. And guess what? That distrust of police officers transfers to other adult figures in their lives, right? Teachers, counselors. And when we do trainings with defense attorneys, we remind them, and even for the defense bar, it's all of us, right? The distrust has become so real. And imagine what that distrust, right? That distrust that transfers over to the school system, right? And children go to school and they're distracted and they're withdrawn and can't learn as a result of the pervasive presence of police in their lives. And what's so powerful about this research is that it shows that policing, excuse me, that trauma occurs not only from being the direct target of police violence, but also from witnessing or hearing about it from friends and family or someone who's close to them. So just having to worry about being a victim of some sort of police violence is in and of itself a source of stress. And pushing it even further, the research shows that even watching police brutality involving people that they don't even know is just as traumatic as being there. So researchers have found what they call, a, have, have found a significant association between what they call traumatic events online and post-traumatic stress disorder, right? And so children who have been watching this, particularly in their adolescent years, the studies really focus on adolescents, in their adolescent years um, are experiencing these events and re-experiencing these events played over and over again as if they were actually there. <laughs> and so on one end of the, the spectrum, you've got kids who are in this constant state of hyper arousal, and then on the other end of the spectrum where kids are just completely numb to it all. And what's so powerful about this particular research, I just love this, um, is that this study in particular was a follow-up, right, or a continuation of some research that was done after the Twin Towers collapse, right? And so they were studying how people, uh, you know, the, the trauma that people suffered just from watching it. They also replicated these studies after the Boston Marathon bombing and then after Hurricane Katrina when people were watching others stranded on bridges. And so now they're doing that same research with adolescents, uh, watching police brutality on television, and the effects are really profound. Uh, research also shows that young people and, and young people who live in communities with a heavy police presence experience uh, and, and have uh, frequent police stops 
have significantly greater odds of suffering from insomnia or poor sleep quality of some sort. Again, I can't tell you, we know this, right? Any of you who has a child, right? Who didn't sleep the night before, <laughs> right? Um, it affects their ability to focus in school the next day. It, affects their, it affects their uh, emotions and attitudes. And this is really important. It affects their ability to behave calmly and respectfully in a school system. And one of the most important ways that policing affects adolescents is in adolescent identity formation. Sounds like a fancy word, but we know that's actually one of the most important things that happens during our adolescent years. And so frequent police interventions affects a child's self-esteem, causing them to question who they are, who they can become, and to be quite frankly, whether it's even worth it to participate in mainstream society. And the same research shows that negative experiences with the police affects adolescent perceptions about the fairness and the legitimacy of law enforcement. So early, so I, and I should really say this, and I think we know this, but it's worth surfacing that adolescence is a time when our views and perspectives about law and law enforcement become firmly fixed in us, right? And they affect how we engage with and think about law and law enforcement in the future. And it is precisely because young people begin to question whether it's even worth it to participate in mainstream society that we see and we understand research that shows that actually over-policing, hyper-surveillance actually increases crime instead of reducing crime, right? It increases that stress and that anxiety that leads to an increase in crime. And so now let me complicate things because I don't want to act like this is all black and white. <laughs> We're in a law school uh, context, so let's complicate things just a little bit. So some of you might be wondering, well, how in the world did I come to represent Andre if he didn't do anything wrong? Anybody pick that up, <laughs> right? So, right, so, so I represented Andre because Andre did in fact have a gun. And so our first reaction might be to praise the officers for getting that one gun off the street. But a deeper analysis of this question, a more nuanced analysis of this question should cause us to think hard about the consequences of that stop. It is far from clear that recovering Andre's gun improved our overall public safety enough to outweigh the harm done to racial equity, fundamental privacy, community respect for law enforcement, and the psychological well-being of black youth all over the country. Um, the officer's request, as we begin to unpack this, the officer's request were clearly laden with racially biased assumptions. They stopped those children and asked them to, for a search because they were black. <laughs> This notion of being able to be Ferris Bueller who can drive through the city and never get stopped. <laughs> Most of us take it for granted that we can walk through our neighborhoods and not get stopped without any, undue, without any undue intrusion from the police officer, absent what, since it's a room full of lawyers, <laughs> absent reasonable articulable suspicion to believe we've committed some kind of crime, right? But for black children, that is absolutely positively not a reality for so many black children in our society. And so in this case, the officers testified, you know, had a hearing, the officers testified at the uh, preliminary hearing and they admitted on the stand, oh no, 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 we didn't have any reason to believe that he had a gun, said it on the record. But they were adamant, absolutely adamant on the record, what? That they consented, that the boys consented, so we didn't need reasonable articulable suspicion. Okay, I hope all of you are bothered by that, right? Um, truly. What they fail to appreciate is that voluntary isn't quite so voluntary <laughs> if you think you're going to get shot, <laughs> right? Um, and so you pick any day in any month in a city like Washington, D.C., right here in Cleveland, and you will hear stories like Andre's, stories about black youth who comply with unlawful stops and frisks and quote unquote requests for search by the police in order to uh, avoid worse outcomes. And so I asked the question over and over again, is it worth it to get that one gun off the street? Another piece of this analysis is that the vast majority, and I think we know this, right? The vast majority of people who are stopped never have a weapon of any sort. 
never have any contraband whatsoever. And so for those of us who are old enough to remember, um, we can look back to that data, the, the statistics in 2011 um, from New York showing that out of more than 689,000 stops in New York City, contraband was recovered in only 2%, 2% of those encounters. That's unreal. But that low yield rate was also evident and is still also evident in Washington, D.C., where my client Andre was arrested. Data um, involving youth stops in particular um, over a 30-day window. They did a 30-day window at our, our urging, right, really urging the, the police department to stop and look at the data. It wasn't data that they were tracking regularly. But in a 30-day window between July 22nd and August uh, 18 of 2019, there were 412 children stopped in that 30-day window in Washington, D.C. Out of those youth who were stopped, 96% were black or brown. Only six children, not 6%, <laughs> six children were white that were stopped in Washington, D.C. And in those encounters, a gun was found in only four of those stops. Not 4%, four. Four out of 412. Drugs, get this, drugs were only found in one of those stops, one out of 412. So at the end of the day, we are willing to traumatize. You heard all the research I gave you. We are willing to, willing to traumatize 407 youth to get one gun off the street or four guns off the street in that particular 30-day window. And it is that trauma that we have to remember and the ripple effects of that trauma on the health and the well-being of young people as well as their relationship to officers, right, and their relationship to the world is what we have to consider in deciding what strategies are appropriate for public safety. You know, at the end of the day, this is the message that I really drive home for folks, is that um, criminalization, hyper-surveillance, and aggressive policing is ultimately does not make any of us, doesn't make kids any safer, doesn't make police any safer, and it does not make the public any safer. So before I move on from policing, I have to at least say a word about police and schools, because you're expecting me to, <laughs> right? Um, so I have to say a word about police and schools. And um, we know now that school resource officers appear in all 50 states. And I have to confess to you that for far too long, as long as I've been doing the work, for far too long, I accepted the simple and often repeated narrative that we have police in schools because parents and teachers were afraid to send their children back to school after the mass shooting in Columbine in 1999, all right? There's some validity to this, right? But when we dig deeper and we look at the history, we see that the story of the evolution of police in schools begins much earlier than that, right? And in fact, the research shows that the first school resource officer or first police officer appeared in a school in Indianapolis in 1939 in response to early threats or early indications or early conversations about the possibility of integration. School resource officers then increased exponentially in schools in the civil rights era. And all of us have seen the iconic photographs of police officers in front of schools with the purported uh, responsibility of facilitating integration when in fact we know that they were in many places an impediment to that integration. And what I really, I just was really struck by was uh, in my research, I learned that there were so many school resource officers in our country that by the year 1991, the school resource officers formed in a National Association of School Resource Officers. That's eight years before Columbine. Eight years before Columbine, under, uh, underscoring this notion that the presence of schools, of police in schools has always been tied to race and questions of race. And then now, indeed, after Columbine and after the other mass school shootings, the government, the federal government did increase funding for police in schools. But guess where the, the, the statistics show that most school resource officers are? 
They're, yes, absolutely. Far, far more likely to be present in schools that have a high percentage of black and Latinx youth. This is true all over the country, notwithstanding the fact that most of the school mass school shootings took place in white suburban neighborhoods. It's a really powerful point to remember. And of course, we know that more police in schools means more arrests in schools, right? And more arrests in schools means more arrests of black students in schools, right? And so across the country, the most recent data shows that black students are three times more likely to be arrested at school than a white student. And of course, Ohio is no different. Data even shows that black children in Ohio schools are 4.8 times more likely to be suspended um, than white youth. And it's really hard to get our hands on the arrest data um, for the state. But you should ask for that, demand that uh, kind of data. And so these disparities to me are especially disturbing when we consider research showing that actually, contrary to popular belief, Contrary to popular belief by teachers, who I get it, they want to be safe, by parents, I get it, they want to be safe, but contrary to popular belief, police in schools actually doesn't make children any safer. Um, and in fact, the evidence shows that traditional law enforcement strategies for school safety are more harmful than effective. Growing body of research, empirical research documenting that. Um, they're less effective, more harmful, because they contribute to the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors, like we've been talking about. They uh, contribute to poor attendance and lost instruction time. They contribute to poor academic achievement. We've already talked about how children can't focus, right? So they live in a community that's over-policed, and then they walk in the front door, only to see police officers who look just like those that they saw out in the community, right? Um, it contributes to increased referrals to the criminal and, and juvenile legal system, and excuse me. And very importantly, it, in, it increases the trauma that I've been talking about. Increases trauma exposure. So the question becomes: um, What do we? How do we use all of this information? How do we use this information to drive change? And so I talk about, I, I, when I, at least when I talk about out, out loud about this, and, and the book, chapter 12, really delves deeper. But when I talk about what do we do about it, I like to talk in four broad themes. And the first theme is that we have to radically reduce the footprint of police officers in the lives of all children, and especially black and brown children who have been disproportionately targeted. We have to invest in alternatives to public safety. And in those rare circumstances where a police officer does need to be in contact with, the, uh, with a child, when the police need to be in contact with a child, we have to ensure developmentally appropriate policing. And then once children are referred to courts in those rare circumstances, again, I want to shrink the juvenile system, right? The, the youth legal system. I already said 80% of it is for children who are engaged in normal adolescent behaviors that are nonviolent offenses. But once they get to the legal system, we have to insist upon a developmentally appropriate response to adolescent offending for all children. We've actually figured out how to do that for white kids. We haven't. We refuse to, uh, to apply the same uh, research and the, 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 the best practices for addressing adolescent offending with black children. So when I talk about um, radically reducing the presence of police in the lives of children, I'm talking about, for example, the police free schools movement. And I always like to say that because it's not as radical as it sounds, <laughs> right? I'm not saying, you know, get rid of all the police, all right? What I'm saying is that we as a country have to be more nuanced, one of my favorite words, more nuanced than thinking about precisely what we want and need police officers to do and precisely what police officers are best equipped to do. And then to relieve them of the task and responsibilities that they're not well suited to do. Makes their job easier, makes their job more successful, and truth be told, they want it. 
if they would just sit still and acknowledge and have a conversation about that. So when I talk about police free schools, it doesn't mean that police will never be involved. We still have 911, 911 ain't going anywhere, <laughs> right? But by removing police officers from the physical presence of the school system, we reduce the reliance, the over-reliance that you know, school administrators now have to just, oh, quickly just call the school resource officer to handle routine school discipline. That was never handled by police departments when we were kids. Just, it wasn't, right? Investing in youth directly, right, means investing in children, in families, and communities, and reducing our spending on traditional law enforcement methods, right? It means that we have to adopt a holistic public health approach to safety, right? that is attentive to the relationships, relationships between young people and adults, that is racially just, that is restorative, meaning that it seeks to restore fractured relationships, that it seeks to restore conflicts or resolve conflicts, and that is trauma responsive. And when I talk about trauma responses, I'm talking about all those adverse childhood um, uh, experiences that children have, right? So violence in their community, um, you know, loss of a loved one, poverty, food insecurity, homelessness, all of that. But it also, trauma-informed responses also have to be attentive to the trauma that is associated with racism and with over-policing in communities. All of that has to be wrapped up in a trauma-informed response. So that means when we're talking about reinvesting dollars, it means we're investing dollars in counselors and social workers, mental health providers, peer intervention specialists, positive youth intervention, social emotional learning, and restorative justice. And I imagine some of you are thinking in your head, but what about those schools that are the most violent? I hear you, I hear you. I want the schools to be safe too, but there's also even evidence-based strategies for dealing with the most violent schools and communities, including violence interrupters, credible messengers, right? There are strategies that have been demonstrated to work if we meaningfully invest in them, fully fund them, and give them a real opportunity to work. And as I indicated earlier, when I talk about developmentally appropriate uh, policing, I'm talking about training officers on adolescent development. Doing research for this book, I was shocked to learn how few police departments across the country are trained in adolescent development. How few police departments are trained in de-escalation strategies, period, but de-escalation strategies for young people in particular, and young people with mental illnesses or disabilities, cognitive disabilities, right? language, speech and language difficult, uh, difficulties, right? So in the book, I talk about young people who are autistic and who struggle with WH words, right? Like who, what, where, who struggle with uh, instructions that police officers give. Stop, stand still, put your hands up, don't move. Instructions you're trying to give an autistic child, right? and you see the kind of violence that follows behind that. We need regulations that limit use of force. We need prohibitions on things like handcuffing 10-year-olds. Why do we need that? Like in my city, you know, it was a big deal. Everybody's all proud. You know, we got a piece of regulation that said that we shouldn't be handcuffing children 12 and under. Really, we needed that as a regulation? <laughs> and the only reason why we had it was because there were high profile cases, right? We had back to back. One year after the other, with the Metropolitan Police Department all over the news for handcuffing a 10-year-old and sitting them out on a sidewalk to be embarrassed and humiliated, right? And then only then we get a piece of regulation that says we don't do that anymore and we want to celebrate it. Sorry. Um, and then, you know, strategies, legal reform that says that we will no longer tolerate consent searches. So Andre's story should never have happened. There's no child, forget race. No child who can voluntarily, right? Voluntarily, you know, tell a police officer, you know, yes, I, you know, freely consent. There's nothing free about that. And then you add race in contemporary America, and you want a black child to come, you know, to say I consent. So it's really, it's beautiful, you know. As, as you know, Gabriella said, we went to the Boys and Girls Club, and they talked about that. They just like, you know, ask for a show of hands. How many of you, if a police officer walked up to you and said, you know, can I search you? How many of you would say yes? Every single one of them. 
every single one of them. Okay? It's a powerful point to think about what it means to live and to grow up feeling like you have no freedom. We talk, we're in a, in a law school, Fourth Amendment. Fourth Amendment has no meaning, no reality for black children in America. And that's what we talk about. And then when we get kids into the system, um, we talk about um, how, what is developmentally appropriate responses even to the most violent offenders. So if I'm, if I'm right and we shrink the system down to about 20% left in the system, those most violent kids, the kids who really need to be there, then what do we do with them? We've actually figured this out. <laughs> There's, there are frameworks, there are evidence-based frameworks shown to work with the most violent and troubled children in our society. Multi-systemic therapy, family functional therapy, aggressive replacement therapy, trauma-informed or, or trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. We know how to use those, right? So if I think about it, I, I try to draw, particularly early in the book, contrast between, with white children who've done some really violent things in our society, right? Folks will remember Ethan Couch, who had a party. That's the affluenza case. Usually, they, uh -huh, right? Remembering, right, he killed four people because he wanted to have a party like any other teenager would. Wants to have a party, jumps in a truck with all his friends, drives to the Walmart, gets beer, and then they go driving out, speeding out, and run into nine people on the side of the road, killing four of them. What happens in that case? His parents get to put him in residential treatment. Parents get to put him in residential treatment. That's the solution, right? And there's so many stories like that. We figure out what to do when it is white children, but we can't seem to figure it out for black children. So the bottom line is we have to treat all children like children and remember that black children are children too. So I look forward to the conversation that I know we're going to have now. I know Professor Hardaway is going to come up and lead us in uh, to get us started in that conversation. So, thank you. For those of you who need CLE hours, the CLE is at 1.5 hours. Uh, so we're going to do a panel discussion now, and we have some guests, so let me read their bios. Uh, Kay Ranke has an active trial practice in criminal defense and family law representation with more than 30 years of experience and has tried in excess of 150 jury trials. She practices in state and federal courts as assigned defense counsel. During her career, attorney Ranke has served as a custody magistrate in Cuyahoga County Juvenile Court handling abuse and neglect dependency cases with the Division of Children and Family Service, Services. She also has served as a teen drug court magistrate handling youth struggling with substance abuse issues, and she currently serves on the board of the Cuyahoga County Drug Recovery Court Pro Se Clinic under Judge Joan Sinnenberg. And finally, she is on the board of directors for Flex High School a startup school for at-risk youth who want to pursue a high school diploma. Our next panelist is Russell Tai. Russ Tai is currently the chief trial counsel at the Cuyahoga County Office of the Public Defender. Mr. Tai served as a uh, chief trial counsel in major trial cases, including being certified by the Ohio Supreme Court as lead counsel in capital defense lit litigation. Prior to joining Cuyahoga County's Public Defender's Office, Mr. Tai served as co-criminal chief of the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office for four years. As criminal chief, Mr. Tai supervised the major trial unit, which includes cases involving Cuyahoga County's most serious felonies, including but not limited to child life sex assaults and capital murder offenses. Mr. Tai was also the first attorney to head Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office newly created Civil Rights Division, where he directly supervised the Conviction Integrity Unit. Under his direct supervision of this unit, Mr. Tai and Prosecutor O'Malley were responsible for the complete release from incarceration or mitigated the convictions of several people, including some ser serving life sentences for murder convictions. 
Prior to his four-year tenure at the prosecutor's office, Mr. Tad proudly served as a private criminal defense attorney and general practitioner for 16 years. That's where I met him when I was a third-year law student. He showed me where to stand in line at court. Um, <laughs> Mr. Ty served as past president of the Cuyahoga County Criminal Defense Lawyers Association and past president of the Norman S. Minor Bar Association. Mr. Ty began his public service commitment as an assistant county prosecuting attorney in Lake County in the mid-1990s and remained there for just over four years. So I want to welcome our panelists to um, this conversation and to join. I feel like I'm blocking people. I want to like get shorter than what I already am, um, but that's probably not wise. So I hope you guys can see okay. How's the shot on this, Dave? Are we okay? Okay. Um, so I have a couple questions for the panelists. Uh, Professor Henning has been talking for quite a bit, so I'm going to direct my first uh, question um, to Attorney Ranke and um, Attorney Ty. Uh, Professor Henning's work shed critical light on the intersection between race, adolescence, and policing, and how this combination systematically criminalizes black children. What have you seen in your practice that indicates our legal system operates to criminalize adolescents in our own community here in Cuyahoga County? And what strategies have you used to overcome that? And you guys, whoever wants to go first. Well, uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's, it's events like this that make me after 30 plus years of practicing still invigorated to do it again. So I, I appreciate it. I do find that the her statistics fit with my own personal experience. You know, I don't have the <coughs> physical data to tell you how many cases and what race they are, but I would tell you that overwhelmingly my experience meets with what you just provided. Um, I think that the focus on trauma has to be always the starting point because the kids that we see in the delinquency system probably are two or three times more likely to have already come through also children's services. So they've already had been removed from their parents. Um, they may be in foster care. They may have no adult support whatsoever. So when they come to the point where they're meeting the police in some kind of encounter, serious or not, they don't have a parent to call. They don't have a parent that they can get in touch with. So then they tell the police, here's what happened. Um, and maybe they don't even have a strong foster parent. So that trauma is instilled in them at that early age before they get to the point where they're committing crimes or allegedly becoming delinquents. One of the big problems is I've never interviewed a child who's, you know, starts out with possession of a gun. And what's really interesting to me is we live in a state where you can bring a gun to church, a bar, anywhere else, and carry conceal, and you don't have to think you can get a license or whatever. Anybody can get it. But a child who lives in a neighborhood has a higher incident of violence and believes wholeheartedly that they need that gun for protection, you're going to criminalize them, and then that's going to be the case that when they had a gun at 14, that's going to follow them why they have to go to the adult system. And so that's a problem because the community as a whole is telling us, more guns are better, we need to protect ourselves, it's fine, it's our right to have a gun. Um, and I, I personally don't have a gun, but anybody who wants guns, I don't care. I'm just saying that this spills over and tells our youth that it's okay for them to have a gun, too, because they're afraid and they need their personal safety. So somehow we have to decriminalize Andre from his ability to have a gun. The other thing is weed. <laughs> I don't know what to say about weed. Um, you know, here's the thing. When I was the magistrate, I found that... Um, probably 85% of all juvenile delinquent crimes, and unfortunately crimes on the RTA, were inner city youth, and they were resolved, involved weed. Wanting weed, stealing phones to get weed, selling things, taping, I mean, all of the problems. So where if you've tried to ride the RTA, there's an announcement that says, don't take your phone out because we can't keep you safe. As you're riding the RTA in Cuyahoga County, the problem is, again, everybody says there's nothing wrong with weed. Let's make weed legal, all right? And, you know, everybody I know has gummies. Well, first of all, if you're going to legalize it, why? You don't want kids to do it. Why do you make it like gummies? <laughs> <laughs> all right? I, I don't know. But, 
you know, and kids, when I did drug court, we had a big debate. We set it up as if it was a national debate for the legalization of marijuana against the legalization of marijuana. And, you know, they researched it, and they, like, did things about Colorado and what's happened and not, and they were very passionate about it. But, but the problem is, again, our laws and our, our con you know, our Constitution, the Sixth Circuit, all of our Eighth District, sorry, Judge, um, who's here with us, but, you know, says the smell of marijuana is probable cause, period, all right? So you have cases where they don't find it, they don't find any marijuana in the car whatsoever, but that gives them a free pass. So the stuff that starts out with, we think that we got a call for, you know, a robbery, and it was in a blue car. They pulled them over. They're not doing anything. They don't have a license. Okay, that shouldn't stop them. That shouldn't involve an entire search of the trunk of the car. But they say we smelled weed. So at the same time, when everyone's smoking weed and everyone has a medical marijuana card because you can buy them on the street, and yet that is the basis for locking up our kids. And, you know, until we can start to change those behaviors, you're going to continue to have the statistics in my opinion. So that's my point. Well, I, I believe in brevity. And I, I, would, I will say this, that my experience, there is criminalization of our youth uh, constantly in Ohio. Uh, and I had the benefit of working as a prosecutor, a young prosecutor, an older prosecutor in the administration, defense attorney for a long time, which I proudly served. And now as a public defender, which I'm honored to be uh, in that role today. Um, and what I've, what I've seen troubles me greatly about, just as from a young prosecutor up until now, an older lawyer, I call myself, is that oftentimes we get stopped in the street, just like Andre, and we don't know what to do. Uh, and, and we're immune to the fact that we have rights. And so one of the questions that you asked me, uh, Professor Hardaway, is that, you know, what do we do as a practitioner every day, as a, as a responsible person in the community every day? And I think that you have to be able to engage in our schools. You know, we're talking about police in schools. We're talking about police in our community that we grew up. And a lot of us grew up in those communities that sit here today. I know I did for the most part. And I can tell you that you are immune to it. And you do feel like if I don't comply, mm -hmm. and if I don't put my hands up, I am subject to being um, a victim. And so what do we do as practitioners, as lawyers, as judges, as social workers? I think we gotta continue to engage in the conversation, continue to, to, to seek our legislators to change the law because too often the laws are just so lopsided, in, in my view. Um, and I know we're being recorded, but I'm gonna speak candid. I think a lot of times we look at our laws and we're protecting, the standard is so high when we're talking about civil liability to police officers and the immunity that police officers have, prosecutors have, and so forth and so on. And who's protecting our children? What, what, what are we doing as practitioners, as responsible parents, and community organizers to help change the system? So yes, we do see it a lot, and one of my biggest pet peeves, even when I was in the prosecutor's office, was bindovers. You know, I think that way too often our laws are so easily crafted so that we can criminalize our youth. And I think personally that the bind over should be the last resort. I was talking to a really good friend of mine who happens to be a judge in the juvenile system. And I will say this, and I'm not gonna put him on the spot, but I will say this, that we do firmly believe, and we grew up in similar you know, disadvantaged circumstances, uh, but we do firmly believe that too often the discretionary bind overs are being utilized to continue to criminalize our youth. Mm -hmm. And you have 15 year olds who are being treated as adults. And then by the time I get them over in the adult system, I'm looking at these kids 
And I'm like, God, I'm not that much older than you, at least 20 years ago. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, they have no real appreciation for what is about to happen to them in this adult system. And I think our judges, I think our, our um, probation officers and parole officers and everybody else is just looking at a, another statistic going through the system. So we are the last defense. I believe the criminal defense lawyers, public defenders in particular, because we don't get a choice in who we represent. And we proudly serve in that capacity. And I will tell you that we have to step our game up too. And we have to get involved politically. So I, I promise brevity, but I can go on. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Move on to the next question, and, and Professor Henning, you jump in whenever you're good and ready. Um, how do you work to counter, uh, and this might be specific instances of your work over the years, right? How do you work to counter or disempower racial bias behaviors, either your own unconscious biases or those you have witnessed with colleagues, attorneys, judges, law enforcement, social workers, probation officers, etc.? What have been the challenges in confronting bias or choosing not to do so in your work? So I know I said a lot. So just what do you, what do, you do to confront bias and maybe share with us some of the instances and then you found yourself doing it? Okay. <laughs> you got some good stories. <laughs> well, I'll start. Um, I think that, you know, we have to recognize our own bias. Me, I know that I have bias from on several different levels. Um, just the trauma that 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 one experiences in encountering police um, at such a young age, and for no justifiable reason, um, you know, being subject to being thrown against a police car and, and searched, and, and and with the story being there was a break in in the neighborhood, and you know, I'm just riding my bike. I'm just teenager riding a bike down the street, okay? So I have to recognize that that not all police are like that, that group that I encounter. That's the first thing. And I, I, and I, can, I can talk for ages on this, but I will say this, that once we recognize our own biases and what we can do to improve ourselves, and, and it's hard because there is PTSD involved with a lot of kids that we represent over the years. It's, it's PTSD with the families that we deal with. And so what we can do to counter that is to really, at least what I try to do, is to really engage with my clients. You know, to really try to understand, you know, not how we got here, because it's obvious in a lot of circumstances, but what can we do to make your situation a little bit better? It seems terrible. It seems like it's the first the worst thing in your life that's happening to you right now is your subject now, and you're 16, you're facing adult charges and adult prison and adult, adult consequences. What can I do as your advocate, you know, on a personal level? And, and one of my golden rules is I never talk about the case at hand, the facts at hand, during my first one or two visits. And, 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 I, and I, I've tried to have that policy for a very long time now because I think that they're human is just like we are and they've made mistakes sometimes, sometimes they didn't. They just are subject to uh, being pulled over or the like. And so I try to engage with them and recognize that just because I see these charges in front of me, the nature of the charges, or just because I see a kid walking down the street sagging, which is another one of my big pet peeves. I don't like sagging. I just don't. <laughs> and, and, and never have. And, and, and I always tell, you know, a little boy, I got a belt for you. If you need to go in the courtroom, I have a belt for you. But I realize that's my bias, and I realize the history of it and where it came from and all that business. But I, it's just a, a bias that I know I have to have, I have to work on. And I try not to let that influence my representation. In fact, I know I usually don't. Um, but I try to really get to know the person that I'm representing. And then we can work on your case. 
So that's one way I try to be, be biased. Well, I could be way in too. Um, so over, it's been about, I guess I would say over the last three years, and so I know uh, Gabriella in my um, uh, bio talked about um, a number of programs that we have started. Um, and so my message is being intentional about challenging racial bias when we see it. And I think it's really hard to do depending on where you sit in the system. So as defense counsel, you know, what do you mean you're going to like have the courage to speak up and name bias where you see it? But I think that's what we have to do. And so, you know, we, over the last couple of years, have become very, very intentional about developing ambassadors for racial justice programs, developing a racial justice toolkit. And one of the, the, the um, exercises that we do, or, or trainings that I do across the country now, literally with every single stakeholder group, defense, judge, prosecutors, probation, is an exercise called see something, say something, right? <laughs> Third party interrupter exercise. And basically, I'm going to tell you how it started. It started because I used to not do it, right? But I didn't have the courage to do it. So probably, I don't know, maybe a year before or so before the pandemic, I was standing in court representing a kid. And my, my client's name was, I'm going to make it up for our purposes, but was named Yusuf Yusuf, okay? And the case, the clerk calls the case. And um, everyone in the courtroom burst out laughing at the name, right? And I was mortified, literally mortified by the moment. And, um, and so I now, I, I, and I'll be honest with you, I have no poker face. I'm pretty, <laughs> you have to figure that out. I'm pretty, right? and I've been practicing that for 20, at that point, 22, 23 years. Everybody knew me. And my face went just like that. And the whole courtroom just went silent because they saw that something had happened um, and that something was wrong. And so the case, the hearing went on. And I gotta tell you, my stomach was in knots. Mm. For the whole rest of that court hearing, and I, the walk back from the courthouse to my office, and I kept thinking, I should have said something. I should have said something. I should have said something, right? This was a teachable moment, and I didn't do it, right? And I got back to my office, and I called together a group of colleagues, and I said, look, let's just sit down, and I wanna talk this through. This is what happened today. And I said, what should we have done? We began to brainstorm what we should have done. Not only did we brainstorm what we should have done in that incident, but then came up with tons of other examples right there from my own jurisdiction. So then I started doing that. I've been doing this all over the place, and I collect stories. They're literally like one sentence apiece, maximum two sentence scenario. Can you count the number of moments that our clients, our young people of color experience some sort of biased encounter, <laughs> some sort of uh, microaggression, walking in the front door of the courthouse, looking at the artwork on the, good, y'all got some diversity up here. Woo, y'all got a lot. It's intentional, it's intentional. It's intentional, right? But going into courtrooms and to places of business where there's no person of color that looks like you, and they're the ones called to judge you, right? Language that we use about children that is so dehumanizing. So for example, the word juvenile. We did some research, there's no other context in which that word is used except a negative context, right? Like juvenile diabetes, a disease. Juvenile male, like a horse. And then all of a sudden, juvenile legal system, which is disproportionately affecting black and brown children. Guess what? Juvenile is the new word for thug, right? Mm -hmm. And so you see a police report that says, you know, I saw the two juveniles on the corner. Really? Really? And so when I train police officers, I say to them, you would never say to your spouse, uh, we're going to go out to dinner as soon as my juvenile gets off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so this exercise was like just a way in which we as a community can become very intentional about identifying the biases, the uh, microaggressions when we see them, and being uh, and, and developing, honestly, the courage and the skills to interrupt them when we see them. And so what we came up with the, with the scenario involving use of use of is I, I wish I had said, okay, I wish I had said, Your Honor, Yusuf is my first client from the country of Egypt. And in fact, it is common naming convention to have the same first and last name. I've learned so much from working with Yusuf. It has been an absolute privilege to serve him. I didn't say that. <laughs> I did not say that. But it birthed this exercise. So that's one thing. It, it really, you know, learning to identify, being very aware, just you talked about, being very aware of what's going on around you, and then having the courage to, to, to interrupt it when you see it. And having grace with yourself, because it's not gonna happen overnight, 
But you got it. You never try. You remember this. So one of the one of the things that I see happening, I guess, in, in favor with regard to bind over, is that kind of like in the federal system, it used to be that you know a person was charged with possessing, selling, if you're talking about drugs or anything, and all of a sudden some very brilliant brilliant lawyer or prosecutor came up with the idea of like we don't have to prove it if we just call it conspiracy and we call it the association the crime itself. What's happening now is I, I'm sure Russ has the same experience, especially with kids, is we now have criminal gang activity. Mm -hmm. And criminal gang activity is the number one way, and I, you know, if you have a judge here, you could probably correct me on that, but that especially black young <coughs> males are being sent downtown because I'm with my brother and I'm in a million pictures yes. with my brother and some of the pictures with my brother have guns but that's criminal gang because my brother also hangs out with that Russ Ty, and Russ Ty has committed robbery, burglary, and so on. Now I'm in the gang. I have a case right now with a juvenile bindover. They made up a name with some stupid. They made it up in middle school because they were all going to create a music label and create music, and now this is the name of the gang. And they refuse to believe that it's not a gang, that it was just people trying to dream about committing or making music. Um, so you have to start to really fight that. And as practitioners, one of the things is the bind over system and the law says it's only supposed to be probable cause. Is there evidence to believe they committed this crime? That. And most, most lawyers, a lot of them wave and they say there's overwhelming evidence, so I'm going to wave the preliminary hearing. You should never wave because you develop evidence that if it does unfortunately go downtown, will result with your client being found not guilty. Secondly, um, there needs to be more ability to attack the police at that preliminary hearing stage and call them out on that. It wasn't really a consent search. That really was, they didn't really make an admission. I know that doesn't go to the overall guilt or innocence, but I, I do think you have to be able to attack that process because that process is labeling our kids before they get downtown. And just one last thing on a personal note on the issue of bias, and this is really hard to talk about because I do a lot of custody cases too. And I'll typically represent, you know, um, both, you know, fathers and mothers, but I had a case um, not too long ago and I represented a black dad who was trying to get involved in his daughter's life. And uh, mom didn't have an attorney and mom kept saying, well, you know, his girlfriend, this, you know, his, this, this, all of what we would, you know, probably disparagingly, despair disparagingly call baby mama drama. But, you know, we were talking about my client, the dad's ability to do his daughter's hair during his time period. And it was a really big deal. And she would be like, no, I send her like this. And he was like, but I have her for three days and she won't let me change the rubber bands. And she puts her, and I want to do her hair and I want to do this. And so we were, you know, my client as a parent has the right to do his own child's hair. And the magistrate, who I love, uh, I worked with her, um, said to me, you know, Kay, you don't get it. You're not a black woman. Hair is a really big deal. And I was so offended by that. Mm -hmm. The bias and the result that I was like, wait, I've represented a black male, and he can't do his own daughter's hair because I, as a white person, don't understand about black. And, and you know, it, it ended up okay, but I use that. Like, we need more education, even how we talk to each other. And I'm not saying that it isn't really important and that I really do understand it. I can appreciate that. But I can't be stopped from doing my job because, you know, point out to me a bias. I'm not going to get offended by it. And if I did get offended by it, is that the end of the world? You know, but I still have to be able to do my job. And so we can't stop fighting for our clients in whatever setting and be afraid that the word bias is somehow going to label me as a bad lawyer, a bad person. We can't stop that dialogue. So I want to be mindful of our time. I'm going to call out one thing, though, that we did not talk about, and that is three of us in here are black lawyers, right? And our county is infamous now at this point because of the serial podcast about white judges in our community, right, saying very biased, racist things on the record to our black clients. And I've experienced that as a practitioner here in this county. Um, and see something, say something, right? I had to develop a meditation practice 
Uh, so I didn't go to jail, right? Um, and so, so I just would love if you could really quickly touch on sort of the difficulties with that and how you handle those moments if you've had to, and then we'll go to questions in the audience, I promise. If I may, I, I had a case several years ago where that very thing happened to one of my clients. It was a, it was a media case where um, a very well-known lawyer got injured um, by a group of youth. And I mean, the media came down extremely hard on these, on these kids. And it was very violent behavior, you know, unfortunately, and there was some serious injuries. But in the end, the client that I represented uh, was 15. And they wound up binding him over. Had never been any uh, system other than like a truancy. Mm -hmm. So the amenability, which is the second part of binding over, is you know first is probable cause, and then there's the amenability. Are you amenable to the juvenile justice system? And they just flew right past that. And these kids wind up downtown. And what you said you established after that use of use of comment. I mean, it's very difficult as a practitioner, especially in private practice at the time, to be in front of a courtroom of judges. And a lot of the way that it works here in Ohio, at least in Calgary County, a lot of the assignments are based upon how you represent your clients and, and the job that you do. But that you have to be courageous regardless. And I'm not too long on horn, but there was a very bad situation where a particular judge um, actually said some very disparaging things about this young man, and I had to call him out on it. And I knew what the risk was. I knew at that point in time that there would be a lot of talk in the justice system, uh, center about what I said, but I had to do it because I think that, and it goes to your very next point, I believe, and, and what tips we can give to practitioners and lawyers to be. Um, and that is, in the end, you gotta have a moral fiber. That's right. If you're gonna do this work, you gotta have a backbone and you gotta have a moral fiber. And I knew that, that I was going out on a limb and I, I knew that my wife probably wouldn't be happy at the time, <laughs> you know, but you had to do it. Yeah, I had to do it. And I called the judge out on it and it became very nasty, you know, unfortunately. And to this day, thank God, we have repaired that relationship, but I did what I had to do, and I stayed out of the courtroom for many years, <laughs> you know, after that. But I did what I had to do, because I think that that child deserved great representation no matter what, no matter what the facts were, how bad it was. And he was very tangential in the whole mm -hmm. scenario. And here he is in the adult system. And I actually saw him when he got, he got the least amount of time of everyone. And, but he did get time, prison time. And, uh, but we fought hard and we got it out of that judge's room and went to another, more uh, what I would call a judge who looked at it from a different lens. And it was to our benefit. Yeah. So sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do in this business. It's not then going to transactional law or something else that, that maybe that you're more comfortable with. But that's my tip for the next question. <coughs> Are you okay if we go to questions? Yeah, please. Okay, can we do that? Um, do we have someone to help with? Awesome. Uh, if you have questions at this point, we're going to take questions from the audience. I want to also remind everybody that there is a book signing after this, so if you do not have the book, uh, there's a table where you can buy the book, and then Professor Henning is going to sign uh, at the end. Do we have any questions? Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, just one comment. I mean, not a few target areas. Like, we you can't know. hear you, Mr. Wright. Okay. Well, maybe I don't need the mic. Well, a couple of the questions were just quick comments. Like, I wish, uh, Mr. Tice, it was as easy as just complying. We, we have so many people that have complied, but that isn't, that's not helping these people. Or where is the accountability when the legal system that we're supposed to trust and rely on, it doesn't bring action to the people that have done these people wrong? Or... I don't have a problem with the bad officers because it's going to be bad people in every profession. But where are the good officers? We all know about the code of blue. Where are the good officers that don't bring the bad officers up? 
or you have the police, what exactly is internal affairs? How do you monitor yourself? Hmm. You know, or thinking about when we think about these kids that have problems, in Ohio, you can be tried as an adult at 14. So, and we never face a jury of our peers. How can we win? And I'm not even saying win, I'm just saying not lose. So, if we have more questions, I see we have a question over here. Uh, and then do we have other questions from the floor to get in the queue? Yeah. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the panelists. Thanks uh, for this for this event. Um, I got a thousand questions, um, <laughs> but the one that seemed to be the most um, uh, productive seemed to be a question that I have. So, very quick story: um, Halloween, me and a bunch of young people I ride bikes with got chased for 30 minutes by Shaker Heights police. And then two of them got arrested. So it's crazy that I'm here to meet you today because I'm Ali and Donald. Well, you know. you're not my clients. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, no, I'm the, I'm the initial guy that called. Right. <laughs> so so um, crazy story, crazy situation. And what happened is, as, a, as an adult, I've been harassed by Shaker Heights police for popping a wheelie on a pedal bike. You know, so I introduced myself to the chief of police because I'm one of few black men probably walking around saying, I, you know, I was the good kid. Um, but I'm probably just as angry as all of the criminals. Um, so I talked to the Shaker Heights chief of police and he asked me what happened. And we're going in a really nasty back and forth about what happened because um, to Donald's perception, he's racist and he doesn't understand how he's engaging with me, so I'm correcting him nonstop. But what I share with him, and the thing that seemed to really make him upset, is on this bike ride, going through the suburbs, we were followed by three different, you know, every city we went in that was in Cleveland, they followed us. But when we got to Shaker Heights, kids go to a BP gas station, and I say, this was the wrong place to stop. Because from my experience of, you know, a hundred or so interactions with the police, I had to learn what I needed to do, you know, separate from all the legal stuff that should and could and would happen and help. And after we got chased, one of the little boys said, this is the reason why you said this was the wrong place to stop. And my question is, what, at what point do I guess we start to really teach young black and brown youth um, not what it should be, but more so what's, how, do you, how do you survive? You know, I find myself around young black men on a weekly basis voluntarily teaching them how I'm still alive. But when I'm listening to um, I guess the, the formal, the, you know, the people in position to make change, I don't really often hear that young people or black people or, you know, whoever they are in the conversation um, being taught what to really do. I, I mean, I'll, be, I'll just say one thing. Um, I used to, as a, as a lawyer, you know, we get paid for advice, and, and I'm guilty of telling clients, listen, I, I'm not telling you it's right, I'm not telling you it's fair, but don't go to Minter Mall, because the second you cross over into Lake County, you're pulled over. I'm never going to be pulled over. I can have a horrible driver's license, five DUIs, they're not pulling me over. But you, they're pulling over. And I mean, that, that doesn't create change, but sometimes you have to just tell the truth and just say do you have to go to Menor Mall? Isn't there another place to get a shot? Because the, the chance of you needing me, you know, so sometimes giving truth to the belief that driving while black is actually a crime, it exists, and if you don't stop it and fight it at the jump, at the initial stop, it continues to happen. Well, I mean, that is a reality, um, what, what you experience, and 
you know, I'll, to me, I look at it as one of my biases when I'm driving at night, even in my neighborhood, which is, you know, suburb, I still don't wear a baseball cap and I still will not have a hoodie up. And my son, oh, dad, I know the street lights are on. I got to take my hoodie down. Because the reality is, it is a different, you know, right or wrong. And, to, and we all know it's wrong because you're being targeted. Okay? But the reality of it is, is that you have to survive, as you said earlier. And I do that to this day. My son will be 14 in a couple days, and he knows what my rules are when we're driving at night. And a lot of times I'm driving out of town. I don't know the, the general makeup. Same rules apply. And let me, let me just add something to that. So, and this is how intense and pervasive this reality is for, you know, for black parents and their children. I was a grown adult, full-fledged grown adult, had graduated from law school and was consulting with the Department of Justice. I had to get on a plane and go to Mississippi. My father, a grown woman, my father, I'm telling him, oh yeah, I'm gonna go to Mississippi, do some consulting for DOJ. And he was like, don't rent a red car, don't speed. If you get stopped, um, do whatever they say. I mean, I'm like a grown woman, so it's that intense. But let me add this, this is what I wanna to add to the conversation. So it's all of that, I think we have, we have no choice but to teach black children how to survive. But we also simultaneously have, have to create safe spaces for black children to give voice to that pain and to the, to insist upon their rights, right? So what, you know, I, I really am devastated every time I see um, sort of the criminalization of black protest, the criminalization of Black Lives Matter, that is the space and the opportunity where many young people have been able to come out and speak. And it may not, a lot of people can talk about being angry. You better be angry. I think it's healthy for you to be angry, right? If you're not angry, you have no self-esteem. <laughs> right, like, you know, I don't want to overstate the point, but right, the anger comes from, I know I am worth more, but I'm not being treated well. And I'm an adolescent, so I might not say it as articulately and organized as, as the three you know, lawyers on the panel might say it, but I'm still speaking my truth and insisting upon and asserting my rights. And so what I say to you also, or say to all of us also, is not only teaching the survival skills, but creating safe spaces, fair spaces for young people to speak up and to insist upon and demand their rights. So inviting them to the table with you know, you know, legislative advocacy. Um, they, you know, they've got to, we've got to have a space for, for people to speak. Because if you're telling me I can't curse out the cop when I'm angry, or I can't yell at that cop when I'm angry, you better give me some other place to tell them. And that's what's not happening. So. And we're over time. I just need to add, I just need to add one thing to the discussion. You can give me later, Eric. And we know that even when we do all of those things right, right, the devastating truth is that we're still not safe. You know, um, okay, Glad everybody has to, we have to move out because I think there's a class in here. Um, so let's be mindful of that. Thank you.